All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, it's nice to meet uh, those of you on the panel I haven't met before. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation about collab collaboration um, on Humanities Podcasts. Um, so I'm just going to, um, we have several different podcasts represented here today. Um, my name is Lauren Gutterman, and I work with Sunia Liganawi, who is here as well on um, the podcast Sexing History. We also have Natalia Petrozella, Neil Young, and Nicole Hemmer, co-hosts of the um, history podcast, conversational podcast, Past Present, as well as Welcome to Your Fantasy. Um, and we have Lauren uh, Burrell-Cox and June Ku, who work together with other graduate students um, from across the country to create podcast Zoom. Um, and they're also working together on creating a new podcast called Under Review to help grad students in the humanities navigate grad school and professionalization. Um, and then finally, we have Zachary Davis, who is host of both Ministry of Ideas and Writ Large. Um, so this is an awesome a gathering of folks from all over the country working on all different kinds of podcasts. And um, I'm excited to hear uh, how everyone approaches collaboration on their projects. Um, so I think maybe the first question to get us started is just, you know, how did you create a podcast in the first place? You know, what audience are you trying to reach? Um, and, you know, we can approach this in any order that you want, um, uh, but it might, might be nice to have people from the same podcast kind of chiming in um, about their own, their own particular projects. Ah, and Zachary put the, the links to his podcast in the chat. If other folks want to do that as well, that'd be great. Well, we can jump in and talk about past, present. Um, we just turned six years old, so we've been doing this for quite some time. Um, and we'd initially, I think we each had different reasons for wanting to do a podcast. For me, I had just left um, a formal academic position and so was really going to miss the part of teaching where you just get to talk about interesting things um, and wanted to have a space to do that. And past present became a space to do that um, and try to reach out to, you know, people who followed the news and were engaged with culture, but who wanted a different perspective, especially, you know, we, we came out in 2015 and Politics has always been superheated, but it was extra superheated at that moment. So finding a way to break out of um, the sort of very contemporary political frames and find a different perspective for approaching the news, I think was really important to all of us. Yeah, I am, let me just chime in on that as part of the, the OG past present team. Um, you know, at that time, I didn't even know what a podcast was when Neil and Nikki gave me their podposal and asked me to join them. But I did know two things, which is one that I was really passionate about being a kind of public communicator around historical issues and kind of, you know, being almost like an evangelist for using historical thinking to understand where we are today. I also knew that there's a very finite, I have very sort of finite abilities in terms of writing. And I knew, especially as I was on the tenure track, like I can't write a column every week. I can't even pitch all the stories that I would like to write about what's going on in the world, but I sure can talk to other smart people. And so it seemed like, you know, a really nice convergence, at least for me to get to do that public communication work without adding on in a way that would have would still be, I think, too much to do a regular writing gig. So that's kind of part of why I came in, why I was thrilled and honored to come into it with these two. I'll just add one last point to that, which is that I think coming into podcasting six years ago, um, we were just kind of lucky at the moment of entry that we had. It was a less crowded landscape, but a landscape that had been very much shaped by um, conversation-based uh, podcasts. So again, kind of what Nikki is talking about, the sort of the, pol the political podcast that really, um, I think, dominated that first wave of podcast making. So Slate or NPR um, or the New York Times had one at the time, the, uh, where they kind of line up three or three different issues for the week and debate it from, you know, maybe different sides or maybe not even from different sides. And so I think what we wanted to replicate was that conversational style, but to 
take it into a context of historians who have a different view of contemporary issues, who are interested um, in, yes, the political manifestations of it as it plays out currently, but in getting to the deeper, longer history of it, and also to model historical analysis. Like that was something that we really wanted to show and we continue to want to show to our audience is not necessarily what is the precedent or what is the historical background of this issue, although that's partly what we do, but more than that, to show how historians think, to give people a different way of approaching the contemporary issues that they're, um, it, that's in their news, um, but that sort of steps out of that political right-left um, framework of analysis. The background for me immediately before starting my show was I was working at Harvard X, which was the new organization Harvard set up to create free online courses. So I was initially attracted to the vision of radical expansion of high quality educational access um, to people around the world. And you know, you all know there was this incredible hype for MOOCs. And we would spend a lot of money, we would work really hard, uh, we would make these free courses, and there would be you know, 100,000 signups. And then you'd look at like how many people actually really took these courses. And it'd be like 50,000 clicked, read, you know, clicked on the first lesson. And then like two people actually finished the whole course. Um, not that bad, but, but basically. Um, and right around the time in which the excitement was starting to fade, I started noticing everybody listening and talking about cereal. And um, it became pretty clear to me that for so many of uh, the, the subjects that people want to learn about, audio is a better medium and it fits people's commute better. Um, so I, um, after starting and listening to Philosophy Bites and being like, wow, this is amazing. I can learn from like all these great philosophers um, as if I'm in the room with them. Um, that's when I started um, my, my my show, Ministry of Ideas, um, in 2016. So it was it was part of a hope of being able to teach anyone around the world, um, bring voices of the academy to more people in an engaging way. Maybe I can jump in, and Lauren, we can talk a little bit about sex and history because I think. A lot of the things you all have already brought up were also very relevant to sex and history as well. I mean, we are uh, a podcast that looks at the history of sexuality, and there really wasn't any podcast doing that and looking at that particular subject area and that dis in that discipline. And so we wanted to both fill that void, but also connect academia to the public and bring our work as scholars, as historians, but in a way that is accessible and that is really user-friendly so that the average person who's you know, driving in their commute this morning can learn about the history of belly dancing or the history of abortion right after Roe v. Wade or whatever it may be, and, and really be exposed to a subject area that in, might be a little difficult in their other aspects of life to really be exposed to. So that was very important for us as well to, and that was really kind of part of our mission as we started. And the other thing I want to talk about in, in terms of who we were trying to reach is we also wanted this to be usable in the classroom for everything from high schools to undergraduate to graduate um, studies as well. And so we, uh, for several of our um, episodes, we've actually created a, a guide for professors or teachers to use so they can integrate the audio into their classroom. We provide primary sources. And so it's important for us that each of our episodes be a complete user-friendly tool um, that to alleviate some of the work I think that professors have is here is a lesson plan for you, basically. And it's also really a way to get students engaged in the material um, that isn't just as traditional close reading textual analysis, but really combining the audio and then the visual use of the primary sources as well. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that, Sunia. Um, but ex I guess except that um, 
for me, one of the most gratifying things hasn't been just professors using it in their teaching, but like when high school students reach out to us and high school teachers, um, that's been that's been really, really exciting. And, and we've actually even had some high school students working with us as part of our team, um, which we could talk about and as we get to more of the collaboration part. But Lauren and June, it would be great to hear about um, your projects. Yeah, so I guess I think we're the only grad students on this panel and we don't have as much um, in terms of years experience with doing podcasting as some of you guys have. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the project that we're doing now that we've been doing since kind of the middle of summer um, called Under Review. And so that project started out because I was working at the UC Humanities Research Institute and one of my jobs was to gather statistics on adjuncting um, across like the UC system, but also just nationally. And it was just really crazy to me, you know, how many teaching jobs are off the tenure track and how like the landscape of the academic job market has changed like since the 70s. Um, and it was also like, there's like a disconnect between like what I was seeing in the statistics and you know the dreams and desires of you know my peers who were in grad school who are kind of looking for academic jobs there was just no real awareness that you know you can go and look outside of the academy for jobs or that you should um and so i just saw like a problem <laughs> that it felt like could be addressed well through uh, podcasting because it's accessible and it reaches a lot of people um, and, you know, these are problems that kind of span multiple departments. And so it would be good to have a medium that would reach people, you know, not just in one department or even in one school, but, you know, across like multiple publics. Um, so our podcast is targeted towards graduate students, um, both like early and later on in their careers. And it's basically to kind of bring, um, to give, to give people affirmation, I guess, for those who are already thinking of um, careers outside of the academy and also to like point people to different resources and people who have gone different routes um, and you know to show them that like a different way is possible. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how our podcast got started. Lauren, do you wanna jump in? Sure, and I guess I can talk about how June and I met since we have kind of an interesting meet cute. Um, so we were in a podcasting institute with the National Humanities Center in the summer of 2020, which was supposed to be uh, in person, but of course was virtual. And we were paired up in a group with um, two other graduate students besides us. And we had some of the best conversations when we were working on this podcast together. They put us together and they were like, make a podcast in four days. You don't know each other at all do it and so we had to find out what we had in common and different things like that but i think we were all really passionate about podcasting as a medium and thinking about public scholarship uh for me like being in grad school you write all your seminar papers you write your dissertation and you know your little group gets to see it but you don't get to have that kind of large audience or maybe talk about topics that aren't totally related to your research but you can put your humanities lens on it. So that was kind of why I got really interested in podcasting because of being able to do that and maybe do that in a playful or different kind of way, which was what in our group we tried to do with making these different audio experimentations. So June and I just really gelled from that. And then we um, continued talking. And so then she came to me with her idea about doing that and we, we teamed up. And so the podcast is a co-production now of UCHRI and the UF Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. So a lot of collaboration going on. Um, I love that story about how you met and um, decided to work together. So I, I'd love to hear from other folks about how um, you came to collaborate with each other um, and uh, you know how that began. So Natalia has kind of um, indicated through her pod prosal um, that we, uh, Neil and I had talked about starting this podcast and because it was a conversation style podcast, but um, we wanted to uh, include a third person. And I hadn't met Natalia before, but Neil and Natalia had met. And um, you can tell just from the few minutes that Natalia has spoken so far that she has this incredible energy that comes across um, in her voice. Um, she has a different perspective 
um, is, her training is different. It's, it's in the history of education, um, to a certain extent, the history of, of sexuality. Like there's a lot that she brings to the table that we didn't have in terms of our perspective. And so we reached out to her and asked her to join us. And that was how the, the team came to get together. And I'll just add that Nikki and I were classmates in graduate school. We both had uh, the same dissertation advisor at Columbia. Um, so we were friends from, from the, you know, the trenches of graduate school. And also Nikki and I had started writing um, for public audiences as graduate students. We both really had this desire to have public voices and we were really leaning into those opportunities um, in our dissertation years. And Nikki and I really, kind of figured out that that path together. We would text each other back and forth about, you know, how to write a pitch or I got an editor's email and here, here you can have this. And so we were already in that process of like figuring out a, a, a public voice. Um, and so the podcasting opportunity was a great opportunity to, to take that um, those initiatives and, and that energy in, in a new direction. And I think just to underscore what Nikki said, the three of us are all 20th century political historians. I mean, that's what the kind of, you know, simple CV description of the three of us is, but each of us approach politics um, from different angles. Um, we, we focus on different kind of subfields of that. And so I think that has given us a, you know, wonderful overlap, but also nice um, kind of other directions that we can pull our conversations in each week that's been um, it's been really rewarding for all of us. Yeah, and just to add to that one, like, you know, we didn't, know, I didn't know these two so well, but um, in the same way that I think we kind of clicked, like for me, it was like, all right, when you're thinking about collaborators, to me, like at least two important things are like people that you feel comfortable with enough that you can be like, friends with and kind of chat casually and not have like all this formality um, around your, your interactions, but also people who you respect enormously and who like kind of push you, who definitely push you to do your best work and where you feel like you're learning from each other. I mean, like working with Neil and Nikki to me is like a constant feeling like this is an A-team group I feel lucky to be part of who are my friends and who are, you know, intellectuals who really inspire me. And to me, like in every kind of collaboration I've done, which we should should say in history is pretty rare as the discipline is uh, conventionally defined. Um, every kind of um, collaboration I've done, I've found that like, that's the sweet spot, like someone I want to hang out with, but who I'm also like, holy crap, your brain just impresses me so much. Like I'm really learning from you. And so I find that is a really like kind of positive energy <laughs> feedback loop that um, makes these collaborations, which are often a grind, um, worth it. So the reason I started collaborating is because I knew I didn't want to have to try to acquire an audience totally on my own. Uh, I wanted some institution to partner with and living in Boston, the best possible partner I could think of was the Boston Globe because they have people interested in learning things. Um, and so they had an ideas section and I pitched the ideas section editors and one of them had a, a radio background. And I myself was not a radio person. I, I kind of, you know, my dad would listen to Car Talk and Rush Limbaugh, but like, I, I didn't understand radio. And I was like, I'll interview smart people and I'll put that interview online. So when I pitched them, they, um, they, they liked me. And they, I did this uh, interview with, I think he's, I think he's at NYU, Massimo Pellucci, the Stoic scholar, is that right? Uh, he's in New York. I came down to New York, did the interview. Wasn't a great like high, you know, tape, but um, it was good question. They could tell I kind of could put it together. And the guy who had a, a radio background, he's like, hey, this is a cool idea. Um, but if we're going to partner with you, it's going to need to be produced. And I, I like literally didn't know what he was talking about. I'm like, oh, oh, sure. I can, I can produce it. Um, you know, and I found out he meant make it sound like NPR. Um, so I then found that there's this, you know, audiophile community in Boston and there was a listserv. And so I emailed them and said, hey, I need someone to help me make something produced. Um, and it was perfect. People who knew how to edit and, you know, do all the make it sound amazing. And I would bring all the nerdy stuff. Um, so that was that was sort of the impetus of collaborating. And then um, after I did one season of Ministry of Ideas, which was 
basically all my hobby horses um, and pet peeves about culture. Um, I wanted to find other people with their own questions and their own interests and passions and backgrounds. Um, and so the podcast kind of moved the model from like me writing everything to finding grad students who were obsessed with one thing and helping them learn how to do the medium. So I would provide kind of editorial and production guidance with the team that I had put together um, and then brought in people with stories and passions um, and questions um, to turn those into episodes. Uh, so that was um, a little bit, there was the necessity of collaborating at first and then um, the great pleasure. And I, I agree that you, you want people who complement what you're good at um, and who can open up new uh, new vistas and, and, and questions, um, but who are also generous, kind, patient, you know, all, the, all the virtues that you need to, to work together. Well, I don't know, Sunia, if you wanna jump in. Um, so we're part of actually a much bigger team. We're only a, a small part of the team. And the podcast started really with Gil Frank, um, who we had been longtime friends and he came to me with his pod proposal and um, I said sure okay <laughs> I didn't really know if we could we could carry it off um, but he has enough energy to convince me and he was like and, and at the time we were also working on the international history of sexuality blog called Notches and um, uh, and he said we've got to get Sunia involved because Sunia was working on that um, blog as well. And you know we were both both just so um, impressed with all of her work. And um, uh, you know so you Sunia had been part of the team from the beginning, even as other people have come and gone. But um, I don't know what, if you want to say Sunia because Sunia is really in charge of managing the whole team. If you want to talk about that a little and and maybe that could shift us into a discussion also of like how you you know divide labor and and what the kind of um, collaboration looks like in practice. Absolutely. I mean, I think what's important to note about Sex and History is we are a narrative based podcast. So we you know we craft a script, we tell our stories that way, and so all of our interviews are edited. And I think that's important to distinguish because. Um, it means a lot of work up front, even before we start the interviews, as we have, you know, productive arguments about what we want the story to be, what is the pitch, where is the arg, where are we um, kind of failing in, in terms of our support. And so we have these really wonderful, rich conversations, sometimes over Zoom, sometimes via Google Docs, sometimes via text, let's be honest here, about how, you know, where's this episode going? What work are we doing? And so that's, I think that I wanna share that, that it's a lot of wonderful, rich conversations up front, which really kind of prompt the larger collaboration that actually brings the work, um, work you know, comes to fruition. And so um, in my role as senior producer for Sex and History, I, um, and then you know, supervise our assistant producers. And then we have a lovely team of research assistants as well who are actually undergraduate students. And I think that's important to note is that the team who makes our podcast are tenured professors to undergraduate students and everyone in between. And that's really important for us that we are making sure that um, people at all stages of their career are exposed to how to create a podcast and the work that goes into it partly because it really benefits, um, it's a learning experience for them as well, for our students. And so um, our collaboration, uh, we really want particularly our research um, assistants to be involved from the get-go. And so they are very aware of the episodes that we're pitching, our conversations about where we think we're going with them. And then we start um, work with, as good historians do, we start in the secondary literature and the primary sources, and we really delve into that and we work as a team sharing what, what we're finding and where we're, you know, what, where we think the episode may go and where we need to change direction a little bit. And then after that, I work with the assistant producers to really kind of do a little bit more research, flesh out where we think the argument is actually going to be. And then we start conducting interviews um, with the folks who are going to be the voices of the episode. And then once we have that done, Gil and Lauren do, um, well, good Lauren and I will kind of do an outline of the episode and then Gil and Lauren will sit down and actually write it. And then we all move into post-production after recording. And so um, it, it's kind of difficult to talk about collaboration because we're all involved from every, almost every step. So I don't want to, it's hard to say, here's 
this person does this and this person does this is because we're all doing it together. But I think that's important because then we really see the pros and cons of and everything that goes into creating a podcast from start to finish. And our undergraduate students get access to that, um, to that experience as well. Yeah, the preparation for a, a conversation style podcast is, is pretty different than a produced podcast. And our workflows have really shifted over time. Um, when we first started, I was the one who dove in to learn how to do audio editing and things like that. Um, so we don't have a producer. Um, and basically what we do now is I will put together the readings for the week after the three of us have hashed out what we're going to talk about that week. Um, I'll put together readings, send them around, um, put together a, a script. We have just a script for the top of the show. Um, otherwise, the rest of it is, is just free flowing conversation. Um, and then Neil takes over and takes the audio files and mixes them together, um, which is a a good deal of production even for a conversational style podcast um, and does all of the back end work of uploading and um, writing episode descriptions and coming up with the title for the episode, um, which is a, an enormous amount of work and Natalia puts together the show notes for the show the different things that we've referenced, um, especially for our like what's making history, which is where we talk about our little bugbears that week. Um, I was hoping, Natalia, maybe you could jump in and also talk about um, the uh, production model for Welcome to Your Fantasy, which was a very different kind of show. Yeah, it's um, one that is also highly collaborative, but so highly collaborative that it involves a team of people, some of whom we've never even met, and not just because of the pandemic. I mean, um, well, so past present, as you probably gathered, which from what we've talked about, is like really a labor of love. We've got these like $80 USB mics, like it's we do it all ourselves. There's not really money involved, although if you love it, go to our Patreon, you know, but it's really like a, a labor of love. Um, Welcome to Your Fantasy is a totally different kind of operation. Um, if you don't know what it is, it is a nine episode, highly produced narrative podcast, tons of music and archival and interviews. And that, I mean, to give you a sense of the team. Um, so I was a host and co-producer. Nikki and Neil were both, I think your technical title was consulting producers or co-producers too. There was, we did, we made it with Welcome to Your Fantasy over the course, sorry, we made it with Pineapple Street Studios, which is this wonderful production company in, um, in, uh, uh, Brooklyn over the time between when we pitched it in January 2019 was it right to when it was released finally in February 21 Pineapple Street Studios was acquired by Entercom a big radio company and the show was sold itself to um, Gimlet, which is a part of Spotify. So then it was released at, on Spotify. Now it's everywhere. But um, the thing to think about, I think there is like the, the, the collaboration piece and being sort of open up the three of us, because we kind of came in as a team about like, how are we going to work together on this? To be quite frank, and perhaps a little tacky, this is the first time like money was involved in our podcasting journey. So like, how are we going to, you know, present them with a contract? How are we going to divide this labor and also the compensation for it? Um, that's something that we talked about a lot. And then quite honestly, on the Pineapple Street side, we didn't really have control over those conversations because they are like this well-oiled machine. There was a wonderful senior producer, Eleanor Kagan, two producers under her, two writers, the whole sound design team and artists to make cover art, um, a fact checker who's honestly more rigorous than anything I've seen in any peer review ever in my life, which I'm still like, holy moly about. So um, lots of conversations about collaboration, but also that's an example of being involved with an organization that like does this professionally and has their own workflow. And I guess we technically, I mean, we were effectively freelancers doesn't quite do justice to the level of involvement that we had, but we were external partners working with them. And um, yeah, so that, it's a very, very different kind of conversation and, and process. I'll just add one thing too, that I think the, the collaborative experience of making Welcome to Your Fantasy was so fascinating for us and a, a huge learning curve for us because we were working with storytellers. And as much as I think we all as scholars want to think that, yes, we too, especially as historians, right, that like we're telling a narrative of the past to, I mean, we still, I think almost all of us write with an argument driven, right, thesis driven approach to unfolding a narrative. And so 
to work with just some of the best in the business at how a story is structured, not just in terms of an episode, but what's the overall arch of nine episodes? Like, how do you figure out what's what, what you begin in that first episode, which went through like 20 something versions in order to set up all the things that you want to happen over the course of the following eight was just incredible for us. And I think we learned a lot about narrative storytelling that's um, plot driven, um, that's character forward, um, and, and so I, I love that sort of collaborative part of it because I think, you know, in past present, the collaboration feels, um, you know, it's, it's akin to the sort of scholarly day-to-day -day work um, that we do. And so this, this pulled us in really some wonderful directions. Yeah, so under review is kind of a hybrid of a conversational podcast and then also we have these kind of highly produced segments like we have ASMR segments where we read um, statistics about uh, you know what's going on with humanities grads postgrad so we have both of those things kind of going on at once and how our podcast started since it's only going to be a set number of episodes right now it's not like a weekly thing June and I talked a lot about since we're both grad students, like what are the topics that we really care about? And so before we ever really started writing, we would just do all of these brainstorming sessions, like a lot of brainstorming. And then finally we settled on kind of like, here are the topics that we have. And then um, I really like audio editing. So I'm totally cool with doing that. And June is a lot better at like writing and different things like that than me. So how we divide it is kind of like I do the back end post production and June kind of does the front end researching, finding out who to get on our show, who do we want to interview because we have like a main interview and then we have all these other little segments. And so um, after we do the interview, we transcribe it, of course, and kind of look at, you know, what are the parts we want to include and June does all of that. Um, so it's always like kind of communicating, you know, who's doing what, because it's really just the two of us doing the whole thing. But um, I feel like how we get through it is like, we have like very frequent check-ins, like how everyone said, like over text. Um, and we have like a weekly meeting and different things like that. I don't know, June, if you want to jump in and say anything else. Yeah, I wanted to say that I think our collaboration works really well, partly because we are like in a similar academic discipline, like I'm in comparative literature and I study Chinese film and Lauren is in English and she studies avant garde and experimental film and documentary. And so I think because of our training and our interests, like we're just kind of interested in like using podcasting as a medium, right, like not just for narrative, but like you know, Lauren said like audio experiments, like, and uh, we kind of want to like kind of push like the medium to a different level than what we usually hear podcasts doing. And so I think that really works as well, um, is that we are like both kind of committed to creative risk taking. Zach, I don't know if you wanted to add anything about how you, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about having to figure out production, <laughs> but how kind of um, labor works in your team. Yeah, um, so we have kind of maybe four roles. Um, so we'll have a producer and that would be the researcher or grad student or you know, young scholar who has the question and the idea. Um, and then we have um, then we have a kind of, I guess, mixer. So they'll take the tape and put it at least in a kind of simple, what we call radio edit, where it's just it's just the the words lined up pretty well and edited decently. Then we give that to, we have a composer and sound designer um, and they do original music, any like sound effects and just kind of generally make it polished and mastered. Um, and then my, my role is mainly support the, the storytelling and the, and the writing. So um, I think Neil may have mentioned um, academics, we think highly of ourselves. We think we can figure out anything, you know, really fast. And of course we can tell a story because, you know, that one time when I 
want a fellowship or whatever. Um, but no, in fact, we're we're not we're not very good um, at kind of the the art of storytelling, which radio storytellers are amazing at. Um, and so often the the place where the collaboration is most necessary, you know, and enjoyable is to help people who are used to writing papers and essays learn that writing for audio is just like so radically different. Um, and it's hard, it's, it, you, you can tell them and they're like, yeah, I get it. And then they give you a script and it looks like, you know, it belongs in a journal. Um, and so you're like short sentences, punchy, what's the arc? Like, why do they care? What are the stakes? Like, how do you set this up? There's like, there's so much that goes into attracting and keeping interest when we're compete, you're competing with million, you know, literally millions of other shows. Um, so I think, I think that's where the collaboration is, is wonderful because you, you get, you get great original research and then you're like, how do you, how do you turn that into something that mom and uncle and, you know, normal peeps um, will actually give a shit about. And that's, that's, I think, bigger than just this small little medium that we're part of. This is what scholars, you know, it's an old trope, but yes, it is important that you have ways of talking about your work that um, attract interest genuine interest. And, you know, I don't like the neoliberal justify what we do with metrics, but I, I think we do need to capture hearts and you capture hearts with powerful stories um, and important insights. Wow, that was really beautifully put, um, Zachary. Thank you so much for that. Um, Cap I'm gonna, it's gonna stay with me about capturing hearts. Um, well, I definitely have more questions I could ask, but um, I wanna open it up um, to our audience. Um, if you have questions, um, you can unmute or you can put them in the chat if you prefer, because um, uh, we are supposed to end right at the hour and I wanna um, start wrapping up a little bit before that. Any questions from our audience members? While you guys are thinking of questions, um, I wanted to share my favorite um, example of how I, I have tried to be creative about attracting interest um, in a podcast. So, so the show that I first was called is called Ministry of Ideas, and it's basically popular cultural criticism, popular intellectual history. Kind of why, do, why is the world the way it is? Why do we think the way we do? And we, uh, I had a producer who wanted to do an episode thinking about the Buddhist and Jewish understandings of nothingness, this idea of nothingness and, you know, super abstract, <laughs> super abstract. Um, and um, so we worked on this for a while and it turns out like there's some kind of really sophisticated and strange and captivating explorations of nihilism in this popular crude show called Rick and Morty. And there's this one just absolutely hilarious passage where the guy's obsessed with getting Szechuan sauce, this stupid promo sauce that the McDonald's did in like the nineties or something like this, uh, or, or 2000. So we, we managed to start the episode with this vignette about mass chaos in the real world of Rick and Morty fans trying to get Szechuan sauce at McDonald's and then tie it into, you know, rich philosophical and theological concepts uh, of nothingness. And I love that because like, you know, pop culture can be a wonderful resource for trying to link deeper cultural ideas. And I think there's a connection there. You know, when I, when I said that we'd originally thought about past present um, as a replacement in my case for teaching, um, there are 
tricks and tools that we use in the classroom um, for those of us who, who are academics um, and teachers um, to link up the things that we're interested in and that we're teaching about with things that resonate with our students. And I think what Zachary is talking about is something very similar, which is how do you make um, these ideas, which may seem obscure or arcane, to make them feel relevant and to show how they affect real people in their real lives. Um, so I thought that was a really great example of that. So actually, I had um, a question to all of you guys. And um, so you guys have obviously been doing this for a while. Um, and we are just kind of starting out. So we were wondering, like, where do you get, how do you like procure the resources to fund like a sustainable podcast series? Like, do you have grants? Do you do advertisements? Are you affiliated with like an institution? And also like, how do you manage your time doing the podcast with all of your other commitments? So past present is not a revenue generating operation. <laughs> um, and that was, uh, I mean, look, that's not like a principled position necessarily. It's kind of about where we've decided to spend our energy in terms of how we've built it. We did experiment for a time with um, a podcast platform or like an ad platform that would drop ads into um, the, the, the shows. And that didn't seem worth it for the kind of money that we were making because it was a little bit ham-fisted. And actually one of the funny things that came out of that, and Neil and Nikki, tell me if I'm remembering wrong, but like listeners were annoyed, which annoyed us because we're like, oh, we're sorry. We're trying to make like, you know, a few dollars per episode on this free thing that we're doing. Is that annoying to you? But one of the nature, one of the things about their annoyance, which was actually kind of funny is they were like, well, why don't you get advertisers like Blue Apron or Third Love or like these premier places and we're like, oh my God, you think we're like NPR with listeners at that level that we would command these, these people. But instead it's like, you know, there's like an auto show in Cedar Rapids, come on down. Cause it was locally targeted to where people were. It ended up not being so worth it for us. And that in, in, in it's when we actually are thinking about another platform right now for past present that actually could parlay into some commercial income. Um, but uh, so that's the, the, like totally the story for that. And it was enabled by the fact that we have other income Income, and this isn't our full-time job. Pa uh, Welcome to Your Fantasy is a really different operation where in some ways building on our experience doing this other work, we were able to say, hey, we've, we've, we've made this podcast. Nikki had just had this amazing narrative podcast she made completely by herself about Charlottesville. Um, we pitched them and that's a totally different operation that honestly, you know, paid more than any academic uh, book that I've ever uh, pitched. And so that um, that is an exciting direction um, to go in in terms of making this like a sustainable part of your income because I don't think it's sustainable for anyone to do stuff where the production values that are expected are getting higher and higher and higher all the time. I think that it's really hard. It's almost impossible unless you have the money is no concern to just be like, oh, it's something I'll do on my own. Yeah, I'll just add to that very quickly. There's another podcast that I do called This Day in Esoteric Political History. And the way that we're able to do that is because we are um, uh, connected with Radiotopia. And so there's pairing with a podcast platform. And sometimes that can be more challenging because you have to show that you can attract enough listeners in order to generate ad revenue um, and that you fit in with the um, principles of the, the, plat the platform that you're joining. Um, the things that I have seen that have been most successful in the humanity space for people who aren't like looking to um, generate commercial revenue is are these partnerships with institutions and it could be a center at your university it could be a department it could be a humanities foundation um, but and those can even be something that can sustain part of your salary it, there are really a lot of different models out there but if you can find a home institution that um, sees the podcast as part of their outreach and as part of their mission, um, you can build some really sustained partnerships um, that not only defray the cost, but also pays you for your labor, um, which is always the trick when it comes to humanities podcasting. Um, Rochelle wanted to ask a question about um, working with grad students. If you wanna jump in, Rochelle. 
Hi, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Rochelle. Um, I am a radio producer and a podcast producer and a PhD student. Um, and my question, I mean, maybe it's like a little bit brass tacks, but um, with podcasting, it seems like, you know, tenured professors, this can be like a hobby that you have and something that you do on the side. It may or may not end up on your CV, like based on the style of the podcast and what your research is and your field is. But for graduate students, I find it's a little bit more difficult to, um, to be engaged deeply in work that doesn't translate um, into getting an academic job. And so I guess I'm just wondering exactly like what you see the future is for including podcasting as a meaningful part of research and outreach on CVs and kind of how to make that equitable for grad students so that they're not just kind of pitching in but maybe not getting this like sort of professional um, credentialing from that that we sort of need in this like precarious time. Maybe I could jump in. So I actually started sexing history when I was a grad student. I've since graduated and you know, I have a job now. But you know, I started um, I started the year before I went on doing my research for my dissertation. And so I was doing sexing history at the same time as I was researching and writing my dissertation. And I think what was valuable for me is, and I do want to agree, I mean, and I, Sex and History, we didn't answer the last question, but we are also not a revenue, revenue generating podcast. So I was doing this, you know, this was the five hours I was doing a week where I was finding time to do it. But what was beneficial for me is when I went on the market then, now granted, I also went on the market in COVID in a pandemic time. So it was a different market than, you know, perhaps non-pandemic or pre-pandemic time. But I was really able to position myself as a public intellectual and a scholar who was able to communicate not only in the classroom, not only with academics, but really with the public on a whole. And that was hugely beneficial to me. And I ended up getting um, final round interviews for jobs that I don't think I ever would have applied for had I not done the podcast. So whether that was a digital history job, whether that was a public history job, and again, my discipline's history, so that was my focus. But these were positions that had I just had my dissertation and a lovely list of peer reviewed journals, I never would have been qualified to do. And so I was able to combine my podcast work and the skills that I learned from it in being a podcast producer with my work that I was doing as an academic to open up or do to apply for positions that never would have been available to me. And when I graduated, I'm currently um, in a position at Suffolk University, it's I'm a program director for um, Our Bodies, Ourselves Today, which is in the um, Center for Women's Health and Human Rights. So it's not quite a traditional academic route, but it was still able to combine my own um, my own research with the skills of what it means to communicate with the public, what it means to write a podcast, and the technical skills as well. I mean, I do a lot of audio editing, and so I was able to parlay that to say I can actually help with these interviews that we're going to do for this program that I'm now leading. And, and I, even in my interviews, I talked about my podcast work a lot. And so, it, you know, and I'm only one anecdote and I fully recognize that, but for me, it was a very valuable tool to be able to say, I can combine my academic side with the podcasting side. And I'll conclude my response by also saying, um, in my department, so I graduated my PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I was the only one doing any podcast work. Everyone else, which is, you know, I'm not saying that to brag, but I'm saying everyone else was taking a bit more traditional role. They were focusing on peer-reviewed journal articles. And that then, you know, that put me in a different um, playing field because I was able to say, well, I'm actually doing something different and here's why it's valuable for your department. Here's why it's important because Yes, I have a couple of journal articles, I have peer reviewed stuff, but I'm doing something that's actually quite revolutionary, particularly for the discipline of history, let's be honest here, it's, it's, it is, it's, it, you wouldn't think a podcast would be, but it is still quiet in a very traditional academic sense. So I'm a huge advocate for podcasting as grad students and I can only see benefits to it. I do recognize the labor involved and if it's, you're not compensated, I, I, I was in a place that I had a stipend, so I was able to do the podcasting work on the side. And I do recognize them that might not be feasible for everyone, but for me, it's been nothing but beneficial.
That is a very valuable perspective, Cindy Ann. Congratulations yeah. on the job. And I think Michelle, <laughs> you raise really important concerns. Um, you know, when I come from a different perspective, I'm trying to apply soon to get full professor. So there's a distance from that. But um, I do think that, you know, it depends what kind of podcast you're making, but I think that the nature of the sort of stuff that we're talking about here in the humanities, there's a way to frame the work that you're doing that I think should be very appealing to any, even the most traditional departments. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're definitely senior colleagues I have, even people my age who like barely know what a podcast is and have a sort of snobbery towards anything that's not a peer reviewed article behind a paywall that like 30 people will read because of course that's the superior form of expression, right? Um, you can tell what I think about that. But I think that there's a really, strong uh, case that you can make. Let's say you're applying for like, you know, the most traditional kind of assistant professor track, tenure track job in history, that making a podcast that engages with historical topics and is about narrative and is about research and is, you know, refining your voice as a teacher and a communicator. I mean, these are all things that history departments would be nuts not to want to um, have in their, in their department, in their field. So I don't want to sugarcoat it, like Sunia was saying too, that this isn't a ton of work. And I also don't want to sugarcoat the fact that it means that you don't have to have the conventional things, but like, you know, the, the articles and all the rest and a great dissertation. But I think it's totally legitimate. Oh, should I work on turning this one dissertation chapter into another, into a peer reviewed article or work on this thing that I love and that is new and that is innovative and that actually is doing the work of, that is core to history of using our, our archival and primary sources to tell interesting stories, which may make a contribution. I don't think it's just like packaging that makes that attractive. I think it's fundamentally where these departments should be going. So I, I, I wish we had a position to apply for that you could apply for because it, it's sounds like really, I think this is the direction a department should be going. Yeah, and I think that it's still, I think podcast is still treated in traditional tenure track jobs as in addition to, so you have to have all the other goods and this on top of it is like bonus or frosting. Um, but I also agree with Sunia that it, it opens more jobs to you. Like all of those different departments and humanities foundations that I was talking about as sponsors, given the way that the humanities job outlook is changing and that so many more positions are in centers or across um, departments, there, there is something about this public facing work, which when I was coming up in graduate school, no one even talked about. And then we were talking not about podcasts, but about even just like writing for the public um, was seen as something that was a little bit time wasty. Um, that I think has changed. And as you're starting to think about as graduate students, what the sort of broad scope of potential positions looks like, um, thinking about how you can position, how you talk about podcasting um, as part of your research for um, applications for traditional um, academic jobs, but then also realizing the universe of possibilities that it opens um, in other places in the university besides the department where you're getting your PhD um, and then places outside of the university as well. Yeah, and I want to jump in here because this is kind of like the kind of conversations we have on our podcast under review. We just had um, a discussion with Andy Mink, who's like the VP of Education Programs at the National Humanities Center, who is, you know, he is a huge advocate for podcasting and for that being incorporated into perhaps like, you know, graduate education or perhaps like tenure review. And so I, I just kind of want to affirm and say that like there are people out there who are working on this and who like see this as a problem who want to incorporate public scholarship more into graduate education. Last little Can bit. Can I jump in? Too? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you've clearly touched a nerve, Rochelle, with your question. You've you've elicited all our grad, grad school anxieties that linger for a long time. I'll just come in as the person who never landed the tenure track job and who bounced around academia and other forms for a while. I had a postdoc for several years and then followed that with a a non tenure track short term academic job, putting me on the academic market for six or seven years. But back in graduate school, I had started writing for public audiences for, you know, public um, for Slate, for the New York Times, stuff like that. And I just leaned more and more into that, especially in those years of the um, uh, non-secure academic work that I had 
post my PhD. And in doing that, I mean, I was doing it just because I wanted to and because I thought it was fun, but as I did it more and more and, and the job prospects were working out, I kind of was getting a sense of, all right, um, maybe this is something that I need to pursue more um, directly a, as a career. And so I say that to say that if, if graduate students ever ask me for their advice, which occasionally they do, you know, do all the things that you have to do to set you best up for that academic job market. Write the best dissertation you can. If you can write a peer-reviewed article before you graduate, that's a good thing to do. And also do other things that are possible as a graduate student, whatever those might be, um, with the opportunities that are in front of you to round out the possibilities for yourself as much as possible going forward, because we all know what this bleak job market looks like and it's not gonna get better. Um, and I think by just the fact that you're here today, you have an inclination towards public facing work. And so think about what that means. Um, or all the possibilities that that might mean for you in a future career, and what are the opportunities now that are particular to your position as and, and your place in life as a grad student that you can really um, take advantage of. Yeah, the last thing I was going to say on that, I was on a panel the other day called that podcasting for PhDs at CUNY for the Graduate Center. And one of the things that was striking to me was that back in the old days, when I graduated in 2009, like Nikki was saying, you know, these the questions were like, does an op ed count towards tenure? How should we like deal with that? And it's not only the change in the medium, but no one on this podcasting for PhDs panel or in the audience there, they were not interested in does this count for a tenure because those jobs are so few and far between. It was more like, how do I as a humanist with these evolving podcast skills, like how do I translate that into interesting work and like less about the traditional track, not that you shouldn't pursue it, like I, I you know, but I think because of the changing nature of jobs, there were really interesting conversations about the way that the intense research that is part of getting, a, that is the core of getting a PhD is actually something that you could parlay into working at a podcast production studio or working in other kinds of um, narrative audio storytelling. And if you have the technical skills too that you're already developing, I think that that's great. So that's an interesting shift, which is sad about the state of the tenure track job market, but I think interesting in terms of how the skills um, are valued in other places. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap up so that people can go to the um, other panels that start just in a couple minutes. Um, but I want to thank everyone, the audience members and the panelists for a really great conversation um, and uh, excellent and just following the chat there. Um, and uh, thank, so thank you all. And um, I hope you all get a chance to uh, enjoy some of the other panels happening um, as part of the conference. Thank you. Take care, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Bye.